Well, welcome everybody to Kicked Off. I have my wife to thank for that. Um, she and I uh, have had many experiences. I don't know, there was a joke out there. We, we, train, uh, we train bird dogs out in the woods all the time, and we're always dealing with ticks all on the dogs and ourselves. She has some kind of joke I can't remember about picking off ticks as well. But, uh, I've had I've had a lot of experience with ticks myself. But uh, what we're doing tonight is a presentation that's more about uh, ticks, their ecology, their management. Uh, we will be touching on subjects such as Lyme disease, which I'm sure many of you are very much interested in, but that's a very large and complex and complicated and controversial subject. Uh, so uh, we want to concentrate more on the ticks and the bacteria that the ticks are carrying. And there are some other tick-borne diseases also. Uh, and the other topic that will come up is climate change, another uh, Form complicated and controversial subject. Uh, we will touch on that briefly, but uh, that's a talk for another night. This uh, presentation is sponsored by the Hanover Conservation Commission, uh, which just met here as part of their regular meeting. Uh, and we are entrusted by the town to. Uh, take care of the natural resources of the town and also tend to help educate the public on natural resource issues. Another sponsor is the Hanover Conservancy, which is a private nonprofit, uh, which has a lot of conserved parcels in town, works on a lot of uh, mapping and resource inventories and preservation of properties in town. And uh, the third is UNH Cooperative Extension, uh, we have with us Alan Eaton from Durham, uh, and I also am part of an outfit called Coverts, New Hampshire Covers, which is part of the Cooperative Extension. Um, um, Coverts is uh, volunteers working for wildlife, and um, it's basically volunteers and landowners helping other landowners. So that's the, that's the hat that I'm going to put on tonight. If I can figure this one out. Just shake the hand yeah, here. Okay, and that will go off. All right. I'm going to turn the... Here's our program tonight. I'm going to give a brief introduction and sort of set the context of why we're here and what we're talking about. The second part will be Alan Eaton here, who's up from Durham, from UNH, who is the expert on ticks and, and tick-borne diseases in the state of New Hampshire. When I asked around the various different organizations, they said, you got to get Alan Eaton. So we got him. Uh, he'll, he'll be here and he'll give us a nice talk. He also has some samples over here, and microscope, and a lot of publications. Uh, then we'll have a break. We've got some light refreshments over there, and we can, you feel free to go around and, and look at the various displays. Um, then we're going to have a sort of a sit-down roundtable discussion symposium. Uh, we'll have. Uh, Julie Griffin from the town administration, uh, Tom Dakey, who's the conservation officer from Fish and Game, who will be here to discuss wildlife management regulation. Uh, Darren Mulligan from the Hanover Conservancy will discuss uh, open space lands <coughs> and the management issues that are that they're dealing with. Uh, Jeff Smith, who's a forester, um, will talk a bit about forest ecology. And I, as part of the class, will discuss habitats and the landscape. Oh, let me get started. I basically 
started with a book that has become quite the viable, more or less, on Lyme ecology and tick ecology. It's called Lyme Disease Ecology of a Complex System. It was quite well written up in a, in a New Yorker article that recently just came out in July, and a copy of that, and we also have a list of reference publications available up in front. And this is uh, this is an outline of basically what the book is, and this is probably what I'm going to start with in the introduction. I'd like you to read you the opening paragraphs of this paragraph called It's the Deer. <coughs> Millions of people in New England, New York, the Mid-Atlantic, and the upper Midwest regions of the United States, not to mention many other localities in North America, Europe, and Asia, live in fear of contracting with Lyme disease. They're aware that at any time, they picnic, hike, garden, walk the dog, or play catch. They could encounter a tick and get seriously ill. The pervasive impression is that ticks are much more abundant than they used to be, that they're pretty much everywhere, and that deer are to blame because they're responsible for feeding the ticks and spreading them around. <laughs> These notions are reinforced in virtually all accounts of Lyme disease and ticks provided by newspapers, television, and the internet and are repeated in discussions with neighbors and friends. Deer are considered largely culpable for the, in, for the sense of foreboding that can accompany each spring or summer foray into the house or apartment. The irritation of deer is only increased by their tendency to eat flowers and shrubbery and dash out in front of cars. <laughs> Many people are indignant that their towns or counties haven't done enough to manage deer and protect their health. Sound familiar? <laughs> In more and more of these towns, local people are organizing and pressuring governments to aggressively cull deer in order to reduce the Lyme disease threat. Where did the notion that deer determine tick abundance and Lyme disease risk come from? What if it's wrong or only partially right? What if culling deer, a very expensive and logistically challenging enterprise, does little or nothing to reduce the exposure to Lyme disease? So, we're going to go through the various chapters here about the deer, mite, and weather, and discuss some of the complexity of the situation, but it's, it's going to be great. It's the deer. Uh, basically, we're looking here down at the end of the cycle of where the deer is. Deer is basically at the end of the tick cycle, uh, mostly adults. The, the, uh, Tick eggs are laid. They, I think Alan Eaton will go through the whole biology of this. But the key here is nips attach and feed to small mammals and birds. Um, and that's basically where they pick up the bacteria for Lyme disease. Uh, and you can see this how this cycle goes through two, basically two complete years from end to end. And the deer are the N unit in this little circle. Uh, there's been many, many drawings of this, and this is the one that I found to be the most appropriate. <coughs> but maybe it's the mice. The white-footed mouse, uh, Paramiscus patopus. There's another Paramiscus out there, the deer mouse. Uh, we have both. They're very difficult to tell apart. It would probably the deer mouse is a little more northern, a little bit more habiting trees or whatever. Uh, but between the white-footed mouse, the chipmunk, the short-tailed shrew, and the mass shrew, all the little, little mammals, they carry 90, 80 to 90% of the Lyme bacteria host. They're 90% of the host. I've seen statistics where deer are deer do carry the adults, but as far as hosting and, and spreading the bacteria, they're only like one percent of the part of it. Uh, but they are responsible for a lot of changes in the environment. And, uh, but the bacteria wouldn't happen without the mice. Why the mice? There's a lot of them out there. They can live everywhere. They can live in your house, they can live in your wood pile, and, and they can live out in the woods. When we're talking densities of 30 to 50 to the acre, 
maybe sometimes more. Uh, there's quite a few of them. The reason, another reason why is they're easy to catch, so the researchers can catch them. The man that wrote this book, there's, they, they caught 10,000 mice over a period of 10 years of research. Uh, and they carry a lot of ticks, and especially the larval ticks, they've got big ears in, the, in, in opposite, in, in difference to the, the house mouse, which has little ears. But the, the white-footed mouse has these big ears, and they're bare, and that's where the ticks congregate. Uh, they are easy to track. The, the, the studies also show that the shrews, which are very difficult to track because they have such a high metabolic rate and they die in the traps, and, and they, they'll already leave them. Uh, they are also responsible, but most of the research has been done on white foot mice. Yes, sir. Are cats and mice involved? Cats, cats and dogs? Cats and dogs are involved. They're part of part of the picture, but they're not basically they're not called hosts. And there's a whole terminology around the hosts, whether they're reservoir hosts or whether they're competent or incompetent. A competent host is competent of carrying and transmitting the bacteria. The tick only takes one blood meal out of each in each cycle. But when they take that blood meal, that's when the bacteria is transferred. Now, certain animals, like the white-footed mouse, they're bad at grooming, um, and their their immune system is is set up in such a way that the bacteria don't don't hurt them, and they can spread that disease. Whereas other animals, uh, a possibly a good one too. We get up into some other animals like um, raccoons, and going up to deer, when go, going to dogs and cats or whatever. You've got less and less confidence and less and less reservoirs in them. And when you finally get up to the deer, a deer is considered an incompetent host. It just does not carry the bacteria. These are the guys that carry the bacteria. Also the birds. The American robin is a competent reservoir host for Lyme disease. And I've got a scientific publication over there, a complete study on, on robins. Uh, why? Because they're, they're ground feeding, their feet on the ground. Here's a, here's a, a robin that's eating a tick, but they also carry them around. They're migratory, they can spread the ticks. Uh, so, your friendly robin out on the lawn is a tick vector. Um, a tick, oh, I'm sorry, a vector is the tick. Uh, the vector of the disease is the tick, and the host is the American run. Here's uh, Mary Holland sent me this picture of a song sparrow with a, with a tick right on its breast. It's an adult and uh, an engorged tick. Here's a veery, another bird of the forest floors, understory, moist woodlands, exactly where these black-legged ticks like to hang out. And look at all the ticks around the eye of that veery. And veeries are not, there's also been studies known shown about their grooming habits. Very doesn't groom as well as some of the other birds do. So, start to see the complexity of part of this picture. Well, maybe it's the weather. Uh, I don't know if any of you picked up on this cartoon or the picture of the moose with all the winter ticks on them. Uh, but this is connecting the dots, more ticks, thanks to warmer winters as a result of climate change caused by <laughs> so this is a connect the dots thing. Um, and this, this will constitute the climate change part of the program. <laughs> uh, it's fragmentation. Uh, this is very, uh, very much a part of Rick Osfeld's book talking about how the landscape has been manipulated and fragmented into smaller and smaller patches, uh, which are producing more and more mice and hosts, uh, and we're getting some deer issues and everything else. There's a lot more. There are seas of forest. They talk about islands. Anyone know where this picture is? Yeah. Whoop. 
Everybody's full and the reservoir. No kill, and we've got uh, reservoir road area. We've got grass road phase one, grass road phase two. Um, interesting thing, look at all the edges that are around every one of these houses. And look at the less edge around the more developed area. And then we have one big island in the middle here, and that's Balch Hill. And a lot of us know that there are problems up on Balch Hill, both from deer and ticks and hiking. A lot, of, a lot of issues there. So fragmentation is one of the issues that we talk about. Invasives is another one. There's a study here, you can see the source below on Japanese barbary, uh, which don't eat, uh, the deer don't eat them. So that means there's gonna be a heavier understory. That means there's more leaf litter. It's gonna have good soil moisture, a great house for the white-footed mice. That means more black-legged ticks, means more risk. We talk about food webs, I think. Right down here, here's the key to the acorn. There's been quite a few studies done showing that acorn abundance, as it affects white-footed mouse and deer, uh, you can pretty much predict how bad the Lyme disease is going to be in a given area by the previous year or two years uh, acorn cycles. And acorn is uh, a fruit that's produced on very odd years and, and different cycles, depending on different areas. I think somebody was talking about Elizabeth Kilmer was talking about it on the way in, about how acorn cycles. There's also some studies being done that said the more coyotes you have, the less fox you have, so the more mice you have. <laughs> and we have more mice, what do we have? We have more, you know, this is small mammals, large mammals, those are very But we also have what are called dilution hosts, of what I was talking about before, the incompetent hosts, the ones that don't carry that bacteria. Uh, a gray squirrel, it's a fence lizard out in California that can be covered with these things, uh, and, and it won't transmit the disease. Uh, and then, of course, there are our old friends of deer. Biodiversity. Uh, the more diverse areas that we have, the more diverse an area is, the more species are in it, the lower what they call NIP, nymphal infection prevalence. This, this subject has been studied to death, believe me. Here's a little shot of Hayes Park, a uh, town management area that's going to, we're going under, we're doing a management plan now. And you can see there's a lot going on in this, this particular habitat. A lot of little places for mice to hide. There's some good aquatic habitats. There's pretty good balance here of overstory and understory. Uh, but as you go out from this, you get closer to the residences that surround it. The understory starts disappearing because of the deer and the dynamic changes again. Uh, this is uh, same place, uh, Hayes Farm Park, which is managed in part by the Conservancy and the Hanover Conservation Commission. And here are some issues. Here's the trailhead going right up through the field. Now, part of this field is mowed, part of it isn't because it's wetland. Uh, excuse me. And, um, and this is a trailhead. And we're inviting people to walk up into the woods. And when they get up into the woods, this is what they're, they're into. And most of the tick occurrences are going to be in the woods. They don't like the fields because it's too dry. Um, and there's a lot of birds out there that like to eat them. Um, so these are the challenges of management of public lands. Um, I will talk about letting parents, inviting people on our public lands and, and trails, and how are we going to manage it for biodiversity and, and the ecology. You'll see a lot of presentations and, and, and literature about protecting yourself from ticks by landscaping. This shows a very typical um, landscape where you're having brush control. You put wood chip barriers down to, to produce a barrier. You mow your lawn and you keep everything as dry as you can or you spray chemicals. Basically, you're creating a hospital room. You are protecting yourself, but right past there out in the woods, 
you know, who's lying in wait. <laughs> there are also natural landscapes uh, where a lot of different foods are provided for different species of wildlife, and you have more diversity, and you have more habitats, and you have more things going on. And it's not a very, it's, it's a very diverse landscape. <coughs> the woods are dirty instead of clean. The edges, instead of being hard edges, they're soft edges. Uh, there's meadows, there's weeds. Um, and you can see right here, here's some hostas. There's no deer. Uh, the deer will come up that apple tree, but they don't need the hosta. They've got old food out, out in the woods. So, in the end result, it, it's the ecosystem that we talk about. Um, our little friend, the black-legged tick, is down here, and that's going through various hosts and picking up pathogens. You have predators, you have competitors, you have a little friend, the white-footed mouse, and then these other conditions that occur, uh, the weather, the habitat, and the landscape. So it's a complex picture, and like Osfeld says in his beginning, it's not just the deer. So now I'd like to introduce Alan Eaton uh, from UNH. Uh, he's got a bunch of titles here. <laughs> But um, you are a PhD. And that is correct. And studied entomology. He's, Excuse me. <coughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> He's an entomologist. He deals in bugs. Oh, we used to get his F in entomology class when we said bugs. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can't uh, get up here. And while Jim's getting that ready, is a set of these little slips of paper with URLs on them up front, and I'll start some here. You can pass on. There are uh, links to some publications that maybe have helped to one of them, Jim, and the members of the Conservation Commission have already copied for you. Go ahead. No. <laughs> and we have a list of, on the green papers there. There's a list of publications and web links. We'll go over this at the end. There's also everything that's over on this table is sort of. Take a look at it and see if you're interested in it. But the, uh, the list that you can take home with you over there, I hope there's enough left. Jim, I just want to make sure I don't use a Mac system, so I'm assuming I'll move the space bar or the app. Good. Sounds good. So I'm going to talk about uh, 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 ticks, the diseases they spread here, and their management. And uh, I'll start off by pointing out that New Hampshire is blessed with 15 species of ticks, more or less. Uh, most insects, just like most ticks, don't have accepted common names. So if I'm going to go over them, I have to use Latin names, because that's the way to be correct. So we're going to start with two in the genus Dermacenter. The Dermacenter albipictus and Dermacenter variabilis. <laughs> Dermacenter albipictus is this one which has been in the news recently. People have heard of moose tick. When they hear about winter tick until the recent uh, press, a lot of people thought it was a joke. Uh, no, there really is a species. Anything in the genus Dermacenter is ornate. And ornate, especially in the adult stage, means it's got colored dots and squiggles and marks and things on the outside of its body. Do those look ornate? Yes. There, there, there you go. So this is winter tick. This is a one-host tick. It has a different life cycle from all the other ticks in New Hampshire. Um, larvae wait on vegetation starting about now. <coughs> and they wait for moose or, or, or deer or people or whatever, some host to brush by and touch them. And if you're lucky enough to give them that opportunity, then they climb aboard. And they stay on that same host all winter, all fall and all winter, and finally drop off in the spring. One year life cycle, it's quite different. This is on a moose that I looked at at a checking station, and you can see the ticks down next to the skin. Yeah. Uh, question? Could I ask you a um, question? Go ahead. Uh, the pictures always seem much more colorful than the actual tick does in real life. Why is that? Um, these are really quite colorful in this, the, this particular species. So all the ones and that you have over here on the table are black. Uh, uh, the ones over here on the table are different species. We're going to show you in a minute. You'll see why they look a little different. And also, a faded 
specimen that's been sitting under a microscope light for two or three years showing people what they look like tends to fade a little bit. <laughs> this is one that... They're always dark too. They're all, they're all dark. Uh, well, you'll see some more here. And you'll see some color. Uh, Eric Aldrich took this picture in the middle of the winter, in uh, late winter rather, in a moose bed. And you can see that moose had been bedeviled by all kinds of ticks, some of which fell off and got squashed. But there's one adult female right there. So she drops off in late winter and then lays her legs in the spring. This is what they do to moose. My colleague Bill Sanders in Alberta, he and his graduate students studied, two, found 200 thousand ticks on one moose oh, in Alberta, or Alberta, I think it was. This is one up in Milan or Dummer, taken by one of my grad students. They're not normally that color, but when they've had a, a, a ticks all over them, they scratch and scratch and rub and so forth, and rub off all the hair and all the fur, and you can imagine, therefore, they've lost their thermal protection. Uh, imagine this thing, poor thing, bedeviled, and most of the deaths that occur from these, and they do kill moose, occur at the end of the winter or early in the spring. So there's Dermacenter uh, albopictus. The next one is our most common tick in New Hampshire. It's the American dog tick. It's got a, a relative that lives west of the Mississippi River called the wood tick. But nobody here would ever call it a wood tick, would you? <laughs> <laughs> what about people on this side of the room? Yeah. Oh, I just, I just want to make sure. Good. Oh. So uh, this is the correct name is American dog tick. Uh, you can see it's in the genus Dermacenter because it's ornate. The males look a little different than the females. The males have white squiggles and a dark sputum, and the female has dark squiggles and a light sputum, but they both have dots on their legs and so forth. So. Um, uh, this is one of the three host ticks. This is our most common species in New Hampshire. This one does not spread any of the disease, the diseases I'm going to talk about tonight. None of them. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so then we have two species in the genus Haemophysalis, and these are getting so rare that I'm not even going to show you photos because I haven't seen a live specimen in a number of years. They're being pushed out by other things. So we're going to skip over them. They're still here, but at very low levels, both Cordylus and Leporus palustris. And then we've got about uh, 10 or maybe 11 species in the genus Ixodes. And the most important of these for our purposes tonight is Ixodes scapularis. And the correct name is black-legged tick. It used to be called deer tick, but the correct name is black-legged tick. And there's what it looks like. You can see it's different. From a derma center, it's nice and the female is nice and bright orange, at least in the rear part of its body, but there's no dots or squiggles or, or X marks or anything like that on it. So uh, it looks quite different from derma center. Um, this is the one that spreads Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis, all three of them in New Hampshire, and uh, maybe some others. And then we've got one more, Ripicephalus sanguineus. This one does have a common name, it's the Brown dog tick, is that well named? Mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty, a pretty good name. Uh, that one's the one that's a little more likely to be able to survive indoors and strongly associated with dogs, lots of dogs. So it's often found in kennels. Except for winter tick, all of the ticks that we have in New Hampshire are so called three host ticks, and they follow this life cycle. They start life as eggs. And here's an adult of uh, American dog tick. This female is about halfway through laying her egg mass. And you can see this little egg mass right here. So she has this giant meal that she, she when she fed on something for, for enough sucked blood for a number of days. And she's transforming that meal into eggs. And as her egg pile gets bigger and bigger, she gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally she's a little bitty dried up scale and she dies. So there's the egg mat, and so all of the ticks lay their eggs in masses like this of hundreds of eggs. The eggs hatch, and they hatch into larvae, and this is in our, uh, Dr. Smith took this with her microscope downstairs from my lab. That's the head of a pin, a common pin. How many legs do ticks have? But, but wait a minute, how many are on the larvae? Six. So as larvae, they have only six legs. And they wait on leaf litter down low, 
and they wait for a host to brush by and touch them. And if you are so obliging and give them that opportunity, they climb aboard and they bury their mouth parts and feed for a couple of days and then, I don't know, burp, I guess, and drop off and then transform into the next stage. And the next stage is the nymph. And then it has its full complement of eight legs. It's a little bit larger. And of course, it takes weeks between these stages, and in some cases, months. And then the nymphs do the same thing. They wait on vegetation for a host to brush by. If they're lucky enough that that happens, they climb aboard that host, bury their mouth parts, feed for several days longer, uh, uh, blow it up with blood, drop off, and then transform into the last stage, which is the adult. And in this case, I've shown in a male of American dog tick. And if a tick is lucky enough to make it all the way through its life cycle, if it's a female, it's had three blood meals. Guys, the bad news is if it's a male, they've only had two. <laughs> and um, it takes two years from the time between one egg mass to the next egg mass, a two-year life cycle. And different species are active at different times of the year, so they partition the year up, year up a little differently from each other. But that's basically the way the, way the life cycle goes for all of our species, except winter tick. So ticks quest, and this one is questing uh, at right at the edge of my driveway, five inches from the pavement, on a blade of grass and it's waiting for a host to come by. It's hanging on with its rear legs. Sometimes it hangs on with the rear two pairs and puts the front two pairs out. In this particular case, it only had the front pair out. And it waits for you to, to touch it, or your hair, or fur, or feathers, or clothing to touch it. Ticks don't jump. Many of them don't even have eyes, so, so they can't see you. They react by touch, and so if you touch, uh, uh, they'll, uh, uh, they'll climb aboard. She has a pair of hollers organs on the inside right here and right there and with them she can detect CO2 and when I put my macro lens just a couple of inches closer I breathed on it. That was a mistake because she started doing this. So she knew that I was close by and she was ready to climb aboard. I had to wait almost 15 minutes for her to stop and take the second picture which is what this one is. So they wait for you uh, frequently we have a situation where you find a, a, a tick on your head and you, you, you find it on your neck or something, you immediately assume yeah. it came from the tree up there. No, no, that tick started way, way down there and ended up on your neck or ended up on your head. They almost, almost never are found in trees, maybe uh, one species in tree cavities, but they're almost never found up in trees, except maybe if they're in trees, they're maybe up like two inches three inches. The most important mortality factor for ticks is, according to an elementary school student in Dover, is good. <laughs> that is correct, but, but that wasn't what I was going for. It's drying out. It's drying out. When you, under, when you remember this fact, you understand one of the key ways we have to manage tick, tick populations. If we can make it so that they are exposed to drying out for more part, longer parts of the year, then they don't survive as well. So this is why they do really well in thick brush and tall grass and meadows of waist high grass and places like that. It's gotta be damp-ish, not so damp that the, that the ground is saturated and they'll drown, but nice and damp and, and humid for a lot of the time. So when you know that, uh, you know some of the most important tools you can use to manage tick populations. Uh, even though occasionally a reporter gets it wrong and says in the newspaper that Lyme disease is caused by ticks, it's actually caused by this corkscrew-shaped bacterium in a medical text next to a couple of red blood cells. So the spirochete named Borrelia burgdorferi is the cause of the disease. The ticks are just vectoring it, spreading it from uh, 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 one host to another. If you're unfortunate enough to uh, uh, get this disease, amongst the early symptoms, and these are symptoms in the first six to eight weeks if you don't get treated, include any of these four, any one or more of these four things. Headache, 
fever, muscle aches, and a red spreading rash called erythema chronicum migrans, ECM. So I went to my doctor and I said, oh, I've got muscle aches and fever and a headache. And he says, you're just getting old. <laughs> but the doctors must have a tough time figuring some of this out. If you happen to show the, the rash, that really is helpful, especially if you remember that you were bitten by a tick at that particular location. Really helpful to your physician to help diagnose what you've got. Dr. Eaton? Yes, ma'am. One of the things I tell people in the when I do the presentations is to take a picture of it because of the, it will eventually fade. And many of us have uh, phones and things like that Absolutely. that take pictures easily. You take a few pictures in different light settings. And uh, what, I've, uh, uh, what my physician asked me when I had this earlier on was, did it spread? And I had measured the, the width, and, uh, but that's another story. Uh, the, first, the first picture, this one is unretouched. This is on an upper arm, and this photo I put into Photoshop, and I said increase the contrast. So do you see that the margin of this one is a little bit darker? In some cases, there's a bunch of concentric rings. So this is a red spreading rash that's at the site of the bite, and that it starts 3 to 32 days after after the tick got removed. So if you see a red spot while the tick is still there, this isn't what we're talking about. That's something else. And uh, it fades as it spreads. You were supposed to wait until I got, oh, you did wait until I got to this slide. Very good. It's warm to the touch. Something on the order of 60% of Lyme disease patients show it, which means about 40% don't. Uh, that's my arithmetic at the University of New Hampshire. <laughs> if you are not treated and you go on past six or eight weeks, then you begin to get into so-called late uh, symptoms, and these can, uh, any of these can occur along with a couple of others. Extreme fatigue is quite common. Uh, joint problems, especially in the knees, there are both heart arrhythmias and something called Bell's palsy. Uh, both the arrhythmias and the Bell's palsy are caused by a blockage of one of the uh, of cranial nerves. There's a pair, there's 12 sets of cranial nerves, one on either side here, and if you block one of them on one side, like the oculometer, which has muscular function as well as other things, that means the muscles on one side of your face don't respond. So look at that guy. Do you see? He's trying to smile. Look at the eyebrows. Look at the cheeks, look at the lips. So he's got a blockage on one side. It looks weird. It's called Bell's palsy. And that's one of the late symptoms. This was, uh, uh, I have to tell you the story. My son was going on, this is my son, he was going on a camping trip with the Cub Scouts. It was a place where uh, uh, I said, I, I knew there were lots of ticks. It was going to be late May. I knew that was a bad time for ticks in Durham, New Hampshire. So I said, you be sure and you check yourself for ticks at the end of the day. He said, oh, Dad, I can't. He knew that means you have to take off your clothes. And I said, go into the tent, zip it closed, and do it. Use your flashlight. And so he said he would. The next morning, here's how he came back to me. So, and, and I said, I told you to check yourself for ticks. And he said, Dad, I did. And I said, what did you do then? And then he said, we all went and played hide and seek. <laughs> so I, I couldn't be I couldn't be angry, could I? So do you notice the reddish area? This tick is a good entomologist takes the picture before he removes it from his son. Good entomologist. <laughs> so, so when you see this, this is life. What's happening is uh, she is injecting saliva. She injects cement. She injects anticoagulants. She injects things to hide from your immune system. And so when you see this reddish area that's forming when the tick is still there, that's likely a response to those kinds of things. It's not ECM. Uh, I tried to take a photo of the most recent map on Health and Human Services website, and I couldn't get the, the current one, so I had to use this older one from 2010. They report, every year they report the number of cases by town. 
And you can go to their website. There's a link on the end of my publication. I think the last or the next to last page. And you can go here and look at it. If the town is white, or in the, the way that the film saw this one, it, it's light gray, that means there were no cases reported in 2010 in the town of Benton. If it's darker gray, like in Orford and Lyme here, that meant there were one to four cases in that town, and they did not compute the amount. I think they think it's so low it, it might be, it might be um, misleading. But then if it's got uh, anywhere from 1 to 99 cases for every 100,000 people, like it's this color, like, what's this town right here? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then if it's uh, uh, darker, it has 100 to 199, like in Plymouth, it's a dark blue. And the town I used to live in is just uh, even darker blue, Lee, New Hampshire. Most, if you look at the map, uh, of most of the highest concentration of cases is down in Rockingham and Hillsborough counties. So you can go look at this yourself and see the most, the latest map, this is just the one from 2010. I think the one on the table is 2011. I can't remember if the 2012 one is on their website yet. <coughs> Nymphs are the most common transmitters. They're much smaller than the adults, so they're harder to detect. We miss them. They also have the ability to transmit it faster than the adults can. How big would a pinhead be on that picture? Um, a pinhead would be about this big across. And in fact, if you want to see that particular this this nymph right here, it's on it's on a card by the microscope. Not not now. Wait till wait till. Wait till. <laughs> So uh, I'll tell you about how the disease is spread. Step number one, uh, uh, Jim mentioned this, a larva or a nymph of black-legged tick feeds on an infected reservoir host, therefore picking up the spirochete with its blood meal. A reservoir host is a host in which, when it gets the disease, the spirochete builds up to a fairly high level in the blood. That does not happen in people. So even though we get blood tests looking for, to, to help your doctor diagnose, they're looking for your body's response to the spirochete. They're not looking for the spirochete itself. So that if it feeds on, for example, your friendly white-footed mouse, I'll try picking one up and see if you can do it without getting bitten. Uh, if, if, uh, if, you, if it feeds on this that happens to be infected, then it's picking up the spirochete along with that blood meal. So that's step number one. It's got to acquire the organism. And then step number two, it has to digest that meal and transform into the next stage, which is the nymph. If it was a larva, we're starting out, but the next stage is the nymph stage. And this may take weeks for this to happen. And then uh, during that time, the spirochetes multiply more within the blood, uh, within the GI tract of the tick. And then step number three, when that tick feeds again, which may be weeks or months later, and that tick buries its mouth parts into the host, uh, all kinds of incredible, incredible magical things happen. This is only one sentence, but there's all kinds of magic happening in this sentence. The spirochetes multiply more, and they move to the salivary glands where they get injected into the host as the tick feeds. Sounds simple when you just say it right out, but they're in the GI tract. How do they get to the blood? They directly penetrate the gut, and they make it through the gut and into the blood. And in, in ticks, they have an open circulatory system, so the GI tract is sort of floating in blood. So it directly penetrates the gut, and then floats around in the blood for a while, and then when it manages to find its way to the salivary glands, it directly penetrates inside the salivary glands, magic trick number two, in the same sentence. And then, as the tick keeps injecting saliva, now it starts injecting spirochetes as well. So this, this whole process takes time. And that's why the nymphs require about 24 hours of feeding. 24 hours before, if, before they can start transmitting the organism. There's some evidence that they might be able to make it in like 23 or 23 and a half or something, but basically about one day. 
Adults require 30 to 36 hours of time if you're bitten by an adult. So that's why if you can check yourself every day, successfully find all the ticks and remove them, you can't be a victim if you do it every day because they need longer than that to transmit it. That's one of the weaknesses. The riskiest time, June through mid-July, I think I would say maybe mid-May through mid-July. Doctor, yes, ma'am. So if, if these nymphs are so tiny that it's hard to see them, if you like scrub yourself in a shower with a scrubber, would that remove them? I would suggest that you uh, in, invest the, these help of a loved one to assist you rather than assume that'll do it. <laughs> That's a serious comment. Who is the who, Who's the country in Western singing that has a song that offers to check women for ticks? <laughs> I can't remember what it is. Anyway, I, maybe we, we won't go there. <laughs> I'm going to skip over anaplasmosis. There's very little of it in this part of the state. This tick spreads it. I'm going to skip over babesiosis. There's a lot of it in my part of New Hampshire. There's not much up in here. You can read more about it in my publication. That's about the babesiosis too. Uh, we don't need to look at the cases, but we will look at this one. So this one shows the number of reported cases of Lyme disease. These are data from the New Hampshire Division of Health and Human Services. Uh, over 2008 to 2011 inclusive, and it's shown by county. So notice where Grafton County lies. It's not even in the top three or four in terms of the total number of reported cases. Most of the cases are from Rockingham County, Eastern Hillsborough County, Stratford County next, and then Merrimack. So Grafton's quite a ways down. But notice that all three diseases are reported here. And by the way, uh, all three of these are going up. Lyme disease is currently the most common vector-borne disease in the country. Who knows where New Hampshire lies amongst the 50 states in the incidence of Lyme disease? Anybody know? And we're now third. We just got moved into third place. Anybody know who's second? Vermont. Who's first? Anybody from Delaware here? Delaware. I, I wish we were down in 10th or 11th or 12th, but we're third place. Dr. Eaton? Yes, sir. Those, those are gross numbers, not related to the population of the counties. Those are, those are the to total numbers. So before uh, the data was per 100,000 people, these are the total numbers. What, About 1,000 a year. What actually comes, I mean, how does it get reported? Which one is reported? I don't know the details about the reporting, but physicians have a number of diseases that they are required to report to the authorities, and the disease and the symptoms have to fit certain criteria, and if they fit those criteria, that's, a, that's accepted as a case and it gets reported, so and if it doesn't fit, it doesn't get reported. So you treat it, they'll report it? Um, your physician is supposed to be reporting it, and that's how, it, uh, and, and I assume they all do it. But when you ask around, come to find out, this, it's widely expected there's a lot of under-reporting. It would be interesting to know how many people here have been treated. Uh, uh, we, we, if, if, uh, if anyone wishes to designate to how many people have been, I have, uh, there's a few of us here. And so it's around. It's around. Um, these are my data on uh, the occurrence of the tick itself. And in fact, this map is right here. And you can see it later on in the more detail. I forgot to bring something to tack it onto the wall. Um, the darker the, the, the town, the more number of records from that particular town. And um, so uh, in places that are white, I have no records. No records from Thornton, no records from Benton. Uh, one rec a couple, couple from Lyme, one or two. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, the darker the town, I, I live down here, <laughs> uh, most of these are passive uh, uh, monitoring where people turn ticks into us for identification and we take the data down. But increasingly I'm doing um, active monitoring and I'll be back in Hanover next month when the ticks are a little more active and I'll be checking all up and down. I'm, I'm 
checking out these towns that, that haven't been checked yet, and uh, we'll get more data. Uh, so you can see um, the general pattern is that the highest concentrations of the tick are down in here. The lowest concentrations tend to be in these higher elevation areas here and in the far north. But there's some, especially in the towns right along the river, like Hanover and Piermont and Lyme and Orford and so on. Uh, more so here than, than the row of towns just inland. Right. I'm not sure if we know why. Yes, sir? How is it correlated with population? If you look at population, the most populous county in the state, Rockingham County, that also had the most number of cases. If you look at this, the second most populous is Hillsborough, followed by Stratford and Merrimack. Seems kind of similar, doesn't it? So, so there's this correlations here. There's lots of victim, potential victims. There's also deer. There's a number of factors that affect the abundance. And, and you've got to have, to have Lyme disease in an area, you have to have the spirochete. You have to have the reservoir hosts, which could be white-footed mouse. It could be eastern chipmunk, it could be robin, it could be a number of other things. You also have to have the tick that spreads the disease. You've got to have the hosts that keep the tick going, in particular deer are especially important for black-legged hick. And you have to have people, victims. So you've got to have all five of those in an area in order to have it pull any one of them out and the thing collapses. So you've just identified several of them. The people, uh, we talked a little bit about the deer and the ticks. This is the way I get the records. Uh, this is Chuck LaBelle's it from Maine Medical Center. And this is a tick drag, and you drag it over the vegetation. And the ticks are questing, and if they're looking for a host, they grab on. And after a certain distance, you check it and count how many are there. In fact, if any of you are interested in helping us at deer or moose checking stations this year, I will need some assistance. Uh, I, I, I need helpers, volunteers to help out. Uh, Jenny and her, I can't remember her room name, name um, they're checking this animal and, and fanning the fur to examine how many ticks are on it and recording on the data sheet. That's how we got some of the data that we, uh, that we first used in this study years ago, 20, close to 20 years ago. There's a number of things that you can do to significantly reduce your risk of being a victim. This is one of them. Check yourself for ticks at the end of the day. I do it at the end of the day. Um, after any day that you've been outside. Now, if you've got snow on the ground covering then you don't need to do it. But um, if we've got bare patches and it's mild, yeah, you do. Uh, any time the temperature's above about 42, 43 degrees Fahrenheit, those ticks will be active so long as there's no snow in the way. Um, so uh, uh, especially checking yourself May, June, July, and October. May and June are when the nymphs are most active. Uh, October and May are when the adults are most active. So uh, uh, check yourself at the end of the day. Um, if you, it's hard to see your back. I've got two mirrors at right angles mounted so I can easily see. I don't have anybody to help me. But you may have a spouse or somebody that can help you out. And uh, it, it's very helpful looking at the places you can't see. Check yourself regularly. Remove any ticks that you find promptly. Remove them. When I was a kid, I was told, touch a hot match to it, it will make it let How many other people were told that? Yeah. It'll make it let go. No, please do not. In fact, the other thing I, we were told was, uh, slather it in Vaseline, it will smother it and make it let go. Please do not do that either. We worry that if you touch a hot match to it or slather it with Vaseline, it will inject you with spirochetes in its death throes. We don't know. Nobody's volunteered for that experiment. So we, we prefer that you do not do that. Instead, take a pair of forceps or one of these little tick spoons and these are commercially available, and the name of the tick spoon is, maybe you don't see them marketed in this part of the state, yeah. ticked off. Yeah. It has a little slit in it, and you can fit the head right in that, and then lever it right out. For those people that are getting a little, might, I'm starting to get arthritis, so I have a little more fumble fingers. I use forceps, because I have them all the time. You grab the tick as close to the head as you can, 
and slowly pull it out. It might take 30 seconds. You don't twist and yank, that'll break it off. But that's how you do it. Please, no, no Vaseline or hot matches. Um, I know not everybody hears me on that because we get greasy, scorched ticks and it does <laughs> This is taken at the electron microscope in Kendall Hall, across campus from me. And uh, the part, this harpoon-shaped thing in the center is what she buries into your skin, and she buries it all the way up to here. So you start counting the teeth. These teeth are rigid. So when she wants to let go, she can't just let go. I mean, the life of her progeny absolutely depends on her holding on, and this is the way she holds on, for five or six or seven days. When she wants to release, she has to kind of scissor her way out, and it might take uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So this is why, anybody ever gotten a, when I was a kid, I, I, I got a dry fly in my best dress shirt. I got it in a collar. And a fly, that only had one bar. It took me forever to get it out. If this has 20 or 30 or 40, imagine how long it takes to get that out. So that's why you don't touch the hot match or do the Vaseline trick. Avoid the thick brush and the tall grass. Uh, you never know what might be hiding there. That's where the ticks survive the best. Um, so that's where you're likely to find them. Um, you might want to consider tucking pant legs into socks. If you do this, uh, I need a, I need a prop. <clears throat> so if you do this, the idea behind tucking pant legs into socks, I should have asked for a drum roll. There we go. Uh, the idea of doing this is any ticks that you encounter tend to be low down here. And if you tuck your pant legs into your socks, the ticks that you encounter as they climb up will stay on the outside of your clothing, where they're more likely to get brushed off or you'll discover them long before they get up here. So that's why we do this. So you can see both of us have our uh, If you've spent a lot of time in the woods, there's forest, there's gaiters that you can buy that are sort, sort of elasticized socks that fit over your boot and lower leg that do the same thing. So, um, <laughs> But I have not been named to Mr. Blackwell's best dress list since I started doing this. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. In, in the next few weeks, I'll be mowing about 20 acres of fields. Uh, do I have to worry about the ticks being tossed around? I think they will start being active again about the 25th, 26th, 28th, something like that of this month. That's my guess. And uh, I'm going to come up, I, I think I'm due to come up here the second, third, or fourth in this area, something like that. So uh, that's when I expect. Another thing I do, I have a pair of rubber boots that are fairly slick. They're 16 inches high, and they're too smooth for the ticks to hang on to well. And I do it usually to keep my feet dry, but they also are pretty good at keeping a lot of ticks off. So I use this in combination with other things. That's one thing to think about. You can consider using repellents. This little slip of paper has a series of publications on it, and one of them is on repellents. There's a lot of new chemicals that are available now as the active ingredients of repellents, many more than there were only eight or nine years ago. So you can use these. If you use them for ticks, you would put them on your socks or lower pant legs, not everywhere. And if you were bare, then, then you'd put them around your ankles and lower legs. Uh, so that, that's a possibility. You can use permethrin sprays. There's a number of choices. If, your if, if symptoms appear, see your physician. Guys, a lot of guys are too macho. You, 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 you listen to your spouse. You gotta go to the doctor and go see you about that substance. Go do it. Be an advocate for yourself. Um, when I get a tick that goes through my defenses and ends up biting me, it ends up on the calendar. I don't glue it to the calendar. I write. You know, two inches above the right knee found 10 p.m. today, I write it down, I identify it, and then if other symptoms appear later on, I check the calendar, golly, this is uh, 10 days after this bite, maybe I should see my physician. See your physician, be a, an advocate for your own situation, help your physician out 
by recording when you were bitten, saving the tick, having it identified, things like this. Uh, it really helps. The, the ones that get into trouble are the ones that wait and wait and wait. The longer you wait to get treated, the less successful is the treatment. For people who are landowners or, or managers, there's a number of things that I go over in the publication to reduce uh, tick abundance or to manage them in some way. Manage to avoid thick, tall brush and stuff like that, mowing and thinning and pruning. Fence out areas that have really thick stuff. Move your cu customers or visitors away. Move, make trails nice and wide, free of vegetation. Inform yourself and your employees. Some of the most effective signs I've seen places, just show a tick. Just show the, 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 the uh, silhouette of a tick and reminds visitors, oh yeah, there's ticks here. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, move play equipment away from the wood's edge. There's a number of things that can be done. Here's one. This trail needs to be wider. They were at least starting. They were fencing out the real thick stuff. But that trail, all the ticks are going to be right at the edge of that trail. Uh, make them wider. Uh, there's a number of things you can do. If you want to use pesticides, that is an option. Some people don't like that option. You don't have to do it then. There's both uh, 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 artificial chemical pesticides and there's also organic materials. Uh, June is the best time to control black-legged tick, early June. One proper treatment should make a major difference. I spoke with, I, I won't say where, what county the person was from, but I spoke with a person earlier this last year who, when I gave my lecture in July, had already treated their lawn nine times that year. They treated the lawn. Why would you do the lawn? Any for ticks. Nine times. Oh my God, that's way overkill. Once, the, rock, the proper way though, and a pressure, a pressure application that, that roils up the leaf litter is, is the one that's most effective. Yes, ma'am. I just talked to a tree person about doing that. And they, they have two different kinds of applications. One is an organic one, and they say they usually do spray nine times. But the other one, which is not organic, it depends again on how they do it. For those that insist on the kinder, gentler approach, you sometimes have to accept that it's gentler on the ticks. The lower the leaf litter and the lower few inches of the shrubs and so forth are where your target area is, not in the tops of the trees, not in the middle of the lawn. Waste. Thick brush, thick vegetation, uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, barberry, places like that. Um, you can read the publication to read the materials. This is one where I try to emphasize to people that you have the ability to tremendously affect your risk of being a victim. Depending on what you do, where you go, how you carry yourself, whether you check yourself at the end of the day or not, you have the ability to tremendously increase your risk or tremendously decrease it. It's up to you. Our good health, I think we should think of it as a partnership between ourselves and our physicians and the medical system and so on and so forth. But we have to play a role as well. And a lot of the risk you control, um, like whether or not you check yourself for ticks at the end of the day. Um, this is an example of this week. We're starting to get worried about uh, mosquito spread diseases, and I've been talking to a lot of reporters in the last few days about those. That's kind of the same way, but especially so with the tick spread diseases. You have the ability to control a tremendous amount of risk, and part of it is being informed. This little uh, the URL, the slip with the URLs on it, lists uh, the couple of publications and the video. So if you want to see my smiling face explaining how you can uh, protect yourself from ticks, you can uh, see the video. And uh, let's see, I didn't, want, I didn't list the one on winter ticks, but if you look in the publication, you can read the winter publication as well. Extension's website is extension.unh.edu. You can write down, you, you can use this to uh, uh, look through the URLs. And if you look at the form of the publication of mine on the web, the one on biology and management of ticks, there are live links at the end. And, uh, for example, if you want more information about the diseases, I think the best place to go is the CDC's website, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, cdc.gov. I have to admit 
I don't want to, but I have to admit that CDC's website is a lot easier to use than UNH Cooperative Extensions, <laughs> and easier to use than Health and Human Services in New Hampshire. But uh, uh, there's a place, good place for information on the disease. Um, if you have a tick you want identified, you can send it to us. Our website has the details, there's the address. Um, Health and Human Services has more details at their website, and that's where you can see those maps I showed. And the state entomologist still does a, a tick identifications as a link through DHHS's site. I think. Dr. Eaton, um, have you, if you were to. We can have the lights, Vicki. What'd she go? We can have those. You're right on it. <laughs> if you were to send the specimen, how do you recommend you do it? I mean, you're not going to squish it, but. Um, we recommend that the Postal Service is not kind to unprotected specimens. <laughs> so you put it in some kind of a container that won't get crushed. Uh -huh. And if it's, a, if it's a container like a small bottle or something, you put a little bit of padding in it so it doesn't bang all over the place and fall into 20,000 pieces. Oh, Otherwise, if I just get little pieces of tick, I'd write you back and say, <laughs> your specimen was brown. And that's all I can tell you. <laughs> so, um, and, and the website tells a little bit more about the address and how you send it in. By the way, there's an office of cooperative extension in every county. In this county, it's up in Woodsville, and they can be, you can send stuff to us through them. There's various ways. Um, we do stuff to some degree through photos, but you need a real close-up, good in-focus photo. And for some species, I could only guess because there's too many lookalikes. You need the microscope to tell. And I also understand that there's a different, um, there's the same genus Borrelia, but a different species other than Burkdorfi that does uh, give the Lyme disease. My colleagues at Rutgers and Harvard announced it to, in New England Journal of Medicine this winter, I think, and it's called Borrelia miyamotai. Oh, and it's thought that it has symptoms that are relatively similar, yeah. and I believe the treatment is relatively similar. I don't know much more about it than that. Jim, are, are we going too late? For, uh, should, uh, I, well, feel free to cut me off if you want to uh, move us to the panel right away. Well, <coughs> I, we're going to have a nice panel where we're going to do a lot of back and forth and questions. Uh, <coughs> I would say if any questions about uh, Alan's presentation um, about ticks, and you know, we're starting to get deep into the Lyme disease thing, and I want to get a little bit. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a couple more. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, so you were saying you take the forceps and you get as close to it as possible, and you apply a gradual pressure, and how long would it take to get the thing? Depends on whether it's just attached or whether it's been in there four or five days. I slowly increase the pressure more and more and more till it comes out. Sometimes, it, sometimes the mouth parts break off. So what? So long as you get how long the would, head. I mean, how long would you take? Thirty seconds. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you say a little more about uh, protecting your yard, and in particular, if, there, if it's if there's any point in trying to keep animals out, considering them sort of futile to keep out mice and birds? I cover a lot more of that in that publication you have that was on the desk: Biology and Management of Ticks in okay. New Hampshire. And um, basically, you've got mowing, pruning, and fencing, training the kids not to go into the woods edges. Those are the ways that are the most effective. In addition to that, there's the possibility of using pesticides annually. We've Up also here, got lists out here that <coughs> publications on control of deer and white-footed mice and plants for landscape, etc. So there are a lot of resources out there. And up, up here, the, 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 deer, the tick population is much, capital M, much lower than we have down on the seacoast. So um, having lived down there for a bunch of years, I wouldn't be too worried with what I'm seeing in the few towns I've done in this area. But um, use that as more guidance. Uh, yes, sir. Talking about protective clothing, one of the things that I do when I'm working around the yard is wear those white painter's pants. You know, for one thing, they have a lot of pockets you can put your tools and stuff. Um, but then pull the white tube socks up way high. Now, my wife says that I should never leave the yard. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask about Mr. Blackwell's list. Right. <laughs> but, it, but it works because you can see it works. them on the white pants, you know, rather than your brown Carhartts. Yep. Yep. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, is it possible to have a sort of a The answer is different depending on which of the materials you choose. So some of them are really broad spectrum materials and they can be detrimental to many insects and other organisms as well. Um, the ones that are kinder and gentler, so to speak, the, 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 the organic materials, um, many of them are still pretty rough on many insects. Um, and you've got to make a decision. Um, it would be neat if somebody could invent a material that was deadly poisonous just to take it. But, nothing, but nobody's come up with a chemistry like that. So as a result, you've got to make that decision of which way you want to go. And in some parts of the state, it's serious enough and there's enough uh, of the disease that people say, to heck with this, we're, we're, we're going to nuke the place. <laughs> we're so right. it varies, and that's something you have to decide for yourself. I myself, I'm a, I'm a beekeeper, and I, we have to deal with mites. And it's just like ticks. The, the mites are always there. They're in every hive. You'll never get rid of them. Uh, you can apply chemicals to them, but the best thing to do is to do what Alan talks about, which is the best, best management and uh, essentially try and get a balance to the, to the system that, that you're working with. Uh, like I said before, you can create a hospital room, but as soon as you go outside that room, um, they're going to be there. We, we went to a place where they had specifically made the trails really wide and we watched, and a, a car pulled up, a bunch of kids came out, and the dogs. And the dogs and the kids went, and we, guess where they went? Right to the edges of the trails. And we, and we said, look at how they made them nice and wide, and the kids went right to the edges where all the ticks are. So, there's, yes, ma'am. There's um, an herbal recipe for like um, eucalyptus and lemon balm and stuff that um, you apply to yourself to Ward off ticks. Do you know if that's very? I'm, I'm not aware. Do not know. Sorry. Do not know about it. <laughs> yes, sir. You had a slide where you were showing numbers of populations of ticks by county. Do you want people reporting that stuff to you? Um, they. Uh, if we find ticks, do you want us to report it? Um, it's hard to know how to do this because ticks that get sent to us for identification incur a fee. And it's hard to make it that it comes in for free if you're going to report it, but you don't want to know about it. So we haven't figured out a way to do that. But having people say, oh, yes, I've seen that. No, I don't want that. Because I don't know if you know how to tell Dermacenter albopictus from Dermacenter variabilis, from Ripicephalus sanguineus, from all the others. And I can't, so how do I know? What, what, if, we have an I what if we have an entomologist that verifies it? Um, uh, uh, a little, little better. A little better. And, um, we're mostly uh, uh, trying to build these things ourselves, and that's why I'm doing this stuff this coming <coughs> fall. Again, sitting at the deer stations and okay. new stations. Now we're going to have to. I know everybody's going to. And, and, and we'll, we'll do more. And we're going to have another session, so let's take a little bit of break. If you want to talk down during the break, fine. Um,